If you have your Bibles, please turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, right in the seats in front of you, you'll find some Bibles. Now, I'm going to be speaking out of a New American Standard today, but the translation is very close to what's in the pews there. Well, this is Father's Day. So it seems a fitting message to speak to who? Father. But now this doesn't excuse the ladies for not listening. For the principles that I want to share today, I believe, are principles for you as well as for us as men. I'm going to tackle two important questions, kind of foolishly, because these are written by Solomon, the wisest man ever to live. As God said, there has been nobody wiser in the past nor in the future than you, Solomon. And he posed these questions, and today I'm going to try to answer them. So if you'll follow me into Ecclesiastes chapter 6, let me read from verse 12. Acts, uh, Ecclesi Ecclesiastes six twelve. For who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime, during the few years of his futile life? Who knows? He will spend them like a shadow. For who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? I'm going to tie that to one other verse and attempt to answer those questions from looking at what Solomon had to say as he looked at life under the sun. Now, life under the sun means life down here on earth, living without God just as the world lives every day. And it's an amazing thing to me that this book was written almost 3,000 years ago, and yet it is very relevant even today. The other verse I want to tie with those two questions is found in chapter 7, Verse 8. Now, once I read this, you'll know how they all connect. The end of the matter is better than the beginning. Let me step away from that for a minute. Let's understand Solomon a little bit. He writes this book of Ecclesiastes, and the Hebrew word behind the word Ecclesiastes means one who assembles a group together to speak, the preacher. So in this, Ecclesiastes mean the preacher. Here's what the preacher had to say in chapter 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. Vanity means meaningless, empty, worthless. Vanity of vanities. All is vanities. What advantage does a man have in all of his work which he does under the sun? Kind of almost a similar question what he's asking in chapter 6. Solomon then begins his observations in verse 4. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. It, very simply, people are born, people die, but you know what? When they die, the world doesn't stop. I often thought on the day that I pass from this earth, everybody ought to at least take one minute of silence, recognition of this guy named Bob Huntoon that lived on earth. But sadly, you know what I found? The day I leave, nothing will change from a world standpoint or the world will just what? go on and a new generation will come and a new generation will go. It's happening over and over. This uh, kind of amplifies in chapter 3. There's an anoint, appointed time for everything and there's a time for every event under heaven. Down here on earth, there are appointed times for all of these. There's a time to give birth. There's a time to what? To die. Every one of us has an appointed time, an appointed amount of time here on this earth. Now, how much time do you have? I don't know. 
Let me tell you a little about me. I'm in August, two months, I'm going to have my 40th birthday. <laughs> uh, now, now you laugh because you're amazed that a guy as young as I could be 40. I'm sure that's what you're thinking. No, it says in John chapter 3 that Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be what? Born again. Born again. 40 years ago, I was born again in August. Therefore, I am 40 years old in the Lord. Interesting thing, I was 40 years old when I came to know the Lord. So that's not too hard to add up. In August, I will be 80 years old. Now, nobody should be 80 years old. Trust me. It shouldn't happen to us. And I think, you know, it was just a little while ago that I was on the carpet with little trucks, running them around, making boy noises. You know how boys do, and they're loud and noisy. Then along came this beautiful lady, walked by as a young girl, and I got up off the floor, put my trucks away, followed her. We got married. It wasn't long after that and we are going to have sons, and it's time to get back down on the floor with my trucks and cars and do what? Make funny noises with my boys. Nobody told me how to raise sons. Nobody gave me a book of explanation. All of a sudden, here's this child, and we're supposed to raise them. Well, let me come back to Solomon's question. Chapter 6, verse 12. I'm going to not put it in his question, but in my words. So what is good for a man to do during the few years of his life? It will pass like a shadow. Solomon is trying to say, I don't care how long you have been given, the time will what? Fly right by. I don't think I should be 80. I don't think that should ever happen to anybody. But there's an alternative I wasn't willing to settle for, and that's a time to die. But here's what I know. My time on earth is what? Short. My time to do whatever Solomon thought was good is short. Now, what caused him to ask these questions? He had just been looking at men who lived their lives under the sun down here on earth and the futile existence that they did. And looking at that, he says, what value is there? Now, I'm going to jump in here and take this on because I could have wrote this book. You see, for the first 40 years of my life, I lived under the sun. I wasn't looking for God. I wasn't living according to God. I wasn't living a bad life. I was living a good life. I could look at any church and say, I'm as good as any of you. Therefore, I don't need anything more. And in reality, if we're just going by how good we are, you can be good and not know the Lord. But it's an empty place to be. So every one of these stories in here are my stories for those first 40 years. I've now had 40 years of living above the sun to be able to teach others about the futility of life without God. And God has allowed me to counsel many young men and tell them, I understand where you are and I understand where you're going. Don't you want to change? And many of them have. Let's go back to chapter 4 and let's just look quickly at some of these individuals that he has noted. Chapter 4, verse 4, he said, I've seen every labor and every skill which is done as is the result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. This too is what? Vanity. Vanity. Rivalry between you and your neighbor is called keeping up with the what? the Joneses. I don't know who the Joneses are, but I know this. I lived the first 40 years of my life believing that what you have, the possessions, 
determine who you are. I taught that to my sons. I, I didn't just come out and give them the lesson. I lived that out before them. Do you realize your families are watching you right now and learning from you? N not from all you say, but from how you live. The neighbor gets a new car. What do you do? Get a better new car. So the merchants out there who build cars love this game because then they sell your neighbor a newer car so he can get ahead of you and now you got to do what? Go get a newer one. It's all about possessions. Solomon says what a futile existence that is. Then he comes down to verse 7 to another man. Then I looked again at vanity under the sun. And there was a certain man without dependent, having neither son nor brother, yet there was no end to all of his labor indeed. His eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, and for whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is what? Vanity and what? A grievous task. Most of what Solomon saw us doing and even today is true, is we're chasing after the wind. And the wind blew to this way, then this, then this, but mostly the wind goes round and round. And we're chasing, trying to get a hold of something that will finally mean something to us. And you can never catch the wind. It's all elusive. It's a grievous task. This man that he's talking about, has absolutely no family, nobody to work for, nobody to leave it to. He poured his life into his work and not into others. Solomon takes and jumps right into that in verse 9. Two are what? Better than one. Why? They have good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, one will lift the other companion, but woe to the one who falls who does not have another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they can keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist, and a cord of three strands is what? Even stronger. What Solomon is saying, he should have built his life on what? Not riches, but relationships. I can tell you this, when this man died, what did he leave behind? Everything. I want to leave something behind as a man. Now material things, I've already figured it out. There's no pockets when you leave. There's no way to carry it out or take it. That new car you got just to get ahead of the Joneses is going to stay in the driveway and your son is going to have a new car. That's what you're doing. You're chasing after the wind. It doesn't count, but relationships, family, friends, people in your life that you build into, they will be here when you go. They are the legacy you deliver. Let's move over again to chapter 6. Going to look again at the ones that triggered these two questions. If a man fathers a hundred children, this is verse 3, if a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, however many they may be, but his soul is what? Not satisfied. Now under the Hebrew culture, the greatest blessing from God would be what? Many children, long life. If you had those, you had everything you needed from God. He should have been what? Content and happy. He had it all, but it says he had the largest family. He had the long years, and yet when it came down to it, he was what? He was never satisfied. Sadly, read the rest with me. 
His soul was never satisfied with good things. And he does not even have a proper burial. Then I say, it is better that it had been a miscarriage than he was ever born. That's a sad thing. He's saying, it'd be better if he never existed than to have a hundred children and there's not a one of them would bury him when it's all over. What does that tell you about his relationship with his family? Didn't exist, did it? He didn't pour his life into that family. He didn't see that as the value. He didn't become the leader of that group. He lived in such a way, I can only paraphrase what the kids must have said. Good riddance. Never cared for him. He never cared for us. Let's pick it up again at verse 6. Even if the other man lives a thousand years twice, let's, let's really give him a bless. I mean, he gets to live 2,000 years. You can't get any more blessed than that from God. If he gets to live that long and does not enjoy good things, then all of us just go to one place. All he has is what? Death. All he has Solomon looks at all of these people and in chapter 6, verse 12, and I'm going to restate it again. Looking at them, he says these questions. Who knows what is good for a man during the lifetime, during the few years of his futile life? What is good? Well, we already know it's pour your life not into things. Pour your life into what? Relationships your family. I mean, look around. Look at the wife you have or the husband you have. They are God's gift to you if you will only see it. it. It's a blessing to have them. The children you have, even on their bad day, is a gift from God to you. All God wants you men to do is what? Be involved with them. Love them, lead them, guide them, direct them. Now his second question was, for who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? Well, I think I can. You see, I lived 40 years under the sun and 40 years above the sun. I raised my son's while living under the sun, I now can tell you about their lives in this last 40 years. I wish I could go back and do it over. You see, I did not understand chapter 7, verse 8. The end is better than the what? The beginning. The end of it, the finish line, is better than the beginning. You see, I didn't parent my boys with my eyes on what I wanted them to be today. I parented them with the idea that my job was to keep them being obedient. That's all I knew at the time. You just get tough with them, and if they get tough with you, you get tougher with them because you have to hold control. And I can tell you the product it produces is not the product I want today. I wish I could go back and parent with the goal of what do I want my family to be future and how do I get them there? Train up a child in the way they should what? go and they will not depart from that way. Every child is different. Now we got three of them totally different. I think a couple times the hospital must have did a swap on us. <laughs> because I mean they are so different. I don't know if you recognize that but they're all different and every one of them needs to be trained how? Differently. I have to look and say where do I want that son to be when he's 
well, I've got kids now who are older than I should be. <laughs> we keep trying to tell Peggy and I that we were 10 and 12 when we got married. That way we wouldn't look like we're quite so old. But we're getting up there. I've got a son that's not that far away from 60 years old. You should not have sons 60 years old. <laughs> but I do. And our sons are good men and successful men and very affluent in all that they have. But you know what I would give everything for? Them to sit in a service with me and love the Lord their God with me and talk to me about spiritual things and be excited and growing and, and I don't care what church but in a vibrant church where they are growing and serving and learning and being that and you know what I didn't get a chance to do that because my oldest son was already out of the house when I became a believer our middle son couldn't believe that we went from no church to I wanted to be in church every time it was open he did get real spiritual at a certain point. We came to one church and he went to the youth group and he came in, there was a cute little gal in the back row and she said he could sit right here. He became spiritual and loved church from that day on. It's amazing what a cute girl can do for a guy's spiritual walk. I wish I could have taught them anger is not the way to deal with anger. But when faced with a son who is angry, it's very easy sometimes just to get more angry and control. And I looked back and I realized there was so much I could have learned. There was so much I could have taught. I could have looked at the thing, excuse me, at the thing and said, what's making you angry, son? Let's talk about what's going on. Let me guide you because this is not a good way to solve it. There's so many ways we can lead our family. But I didn't have that opportunity, but I look around here. Some of you don't have families, maybe. Some of you do, and I can see the children. You are blessed. But now you have the greatest task in your life, and if you are successful in that, raising those kids to be young adults who love the Lord and walk with Him and honor you and would be there when it comes time for you to leave and speak well at your funeral service. That's the best it can be. If I could give you any advice today, in the book of Galatians, there was bickering going on in the church over salvation by grace through faith and salvation by works plus grace, a whole combination. And the church was in a battle. And in the fifth chapter, Paul says to them, if you will walk according to the Spirit, then you will not carry out the deeds of the flesh. And in our readings today, I noticed we had the listing of the deeds of the flesh. But here's the solution. Walk under the control of the Holy Spirit. Now, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Gentleness. What is it? Goodness. And finally, what? self-control. These are relationable things that I want and I wish I could have let my sons know I love them. See, I have big men now and we don't hug. wonder where they learned that. Well, because my dad never hugged me, I didn't understand a guy could hug his son. You know what I would give right now? To have my son walk up, happy Father's Day, and give me a hug. 
you still have the opportunity. You're still building into your family. Are you focused on where you want them to be one day, not just dealing with where they are today? Are you showing them love? This is a big one, joy. Why would anyone want to follow Christ if you don't have any joy? I mean, it's big. Yet I look around and joy is the first thing we lose. It's like a set of car keys. And we get serious and we're going on and we're going, things are serious and important. But if we don't have love, we're not going to attract the world. If we don't have joy, we're not going to attract the world. If we don't have a sense of peace, was it Jesus says, come to me, you who are weary and what? Heavy laden and I will give you what? More to do? No, what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for my ways are what? Easy and my yoke is light. We should have joy and love and peace and patience I didn't have. I met problem with problem and my way was you will submit to my leading and I look back and I go, I didn't teach what I wanted to, but I have good news for you. I'm not done. You see, I'm teaching from the other side now, from being the dad now who's a follower of Christ, the dad who goes to church, the dad who became a pastor. That was... That was a terrible time for my boys, I think. I worked as a banker for a while. They loved telling their friends that their dad was a banker. That's respectable. When I became a pastor, that was the worst thing. How can they sit there and drink a beer with their buddies when this guy who's a pastor is sitting there and he's going to come up, take it away from them, and tell them, cut it out now? I'm leading from the other side. It takes a lot longer. But I'm trying to show them right now a dad who's about to turn 80, who loves the Lord, who loves them, who has a sense of joy even though things are happening. Got a little bit of a tremor in this hand. I don't like that. They're trying to figure out what's the cause, but I don't like that. I would like to back up and not have it. But even with this, I can have what? Joy. In this passage, Solomon goes through several things that are better. Chapter 7, verse 1, a good name is better than a great perfume. It's a shem. That's a good name in the Hebrew. Shemen is a, an expensive perfume. It's a play on words. But he's saying an expensive perfume makes you smell good to other people, but it has no depth to it. A good name, character, who you really are, is everything. <clears throat> it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. Why? Because that is the end of every matter. We're back to the end. The end is better than the what? And the beginning. There's going to come a day when I'm going to be gone. And you'll all have that one minute of silence. Because I'm sure you'll remember that and do it. <clears throat> but there's going to come a day when that happens. And I pray there is a memorial service and I pray my sons would sit in that service and hear people talk about a dad they didn't know. Talk about a dad who had love for the Lord. If I want them to talk about a dad who had love for the Lord, then I better what? I better show it. See, at this age, I'm still not done and neither are you. They're still watching to see who I am. They're still watching to see what I do. I remember a time when our oldest son came to me. He didn't like something I said to a girlfriend of his 
but she needed to hear that and she listened to me, but it interrupted some plans he had and I won't go any further, but he came pretty angry that day. And I thought, okay, here we go. And he said, I wanna know what's, what's with you. And I reached for my Bible. He said, no, I don't wanna hear from that. I wanna hear from you. You see, right now, I am the only Bible he's reading. I'm the only one that is shining any kind of a light in his life because he has a life in his brothers filled with good friends, good friends, good people. They have lots to do and lots of toys to do it with, but there's nobody standing out that I see that is a light to them. And yet Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A light should not be hid under a lamp post or a bushel, but it should be put out for all to see. Right now, I can't tell him to become a believer. If I could, I would. I can only be what? An example of what a believer is and hope he'll come and want the same. And I'm willing to put it all on the line and say, on that day when there's a memorial service, and I pray there is, not for me, but for him, and for his brother, and for their children, for our grandchildren, I want them to hear about a grandpa who was a whole lot different than he used to be. Isn't that what you want? And at that moment, for them to realize things need to change. Let me back up to verse 2 of chapter 6. I'll start it in verse 1. There's an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is prevalent among men, a man whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that his soul lacked nothing of all he desires. He has what? Everything he would ever want. But God has not empowered him to eat from them, for a foreigner enjoys them. This too is vanity and a severe affliction. He's saying, the guy had it all. He got to the point where he should be able to enjoy it and something happened. He didn't tell us what happened, but something happened that he lost the entire fortune, everything he had put his life into and the blessing and somebody else was enjoying it. I think we're not too far from that as a country. You see, I know the greatest opportunity for my sons to become followers of God is for the monetary system in this country to collapse because that's what sustains them. That's what it is. They have everything and they have the money to get bigger and better and more. There's no reason for them right now to want to give up their life and follow God. They're not anti-God. They just haven't been moved with a motive to seek him. Our government borrows and borrows and borrows and I'm a, I've done some finance in the past. What, what I can't figure out is how you pay it back. Because they're not stopping borrowing. Every year they spend more than they take in, which adds to the <coughs> debt. And until you stop spending more, you can't start paying off the debt. And someday <clears throat> it has to come down to where nobody trusts the dollar anymore. You do realize it's just paper. There's nothing behind it other than the government themselves. But if we ever come to a point that we don't believe the government is solvent, then nothing you have dollar-wise is worth anything. And all of a sudden, <laughs> Now people have to turn to something else besides the government, something else besides money. It's the greatest opportunity for men and women who have not sought God to find him. 
you know what the problem with it is? I'm not sure I want to go through it. You see, I love my boys and I want the end result. And until you and I are willing to say, if that's what it takes to turn this country around and bring us back to God, then God, I'm willing to go through it with them. Because you know what will happen? What I have is gone too. All that I have brought together and put together, which will sustain Peggy and I, will be what? Worthless. It will not be able to be used by us. The world needs to see Jesus in us. The world needs to see joyous, happy, peaceful, patient, gentle believers who are walking with him. I'm going to close with a story here. A few years ago, a group of salesmen went on a regional sales convention in Chicago. They had assured their wives they would be home in plenty of time on Friday night's dinner. In the rush with tickets and briefcases, one of the salesmen inadvertently kicked over a table which held a display. A display of apples. Apples flew everywhere. Without stopping or looking back, they managed to reach the plane in time for their nearly missed boarding. They were in such a hurry, they had to get there. They couldn't stop, all but one of them. He paused and took a deep breath, got in touch with his feelings, and experienced a twinge of compassion for the girl whose apple stand he had overturned. But he told his buddies to go on without him, and he waved goodbye, told one of them to call his wife when they arrived home at their home destination and explain his taking a later flight. Then he returned to the terminal where the apples were all over the terminal floor. He was glad he did. The 16-year-old girl was totally blind. She was softly crying, tears running down her cheeks, in frustration and at the same time helplessly groping for her spilled produce as the crowd swirled about her, no one stopping and no one cared about her problem. The salesman knelt on the floor with her. He gathered up the apples. He put them back on the table and he helped reorganize her display. As he did this, he noticed that many of them had become battered and bruised, so he set them aside in another basket. When he finished, he pulled out his wallet and he said to the girl, here, please take $40 for the damage we did. Are you okay, he said. She nodded through her tears. He continued on with, I hope we didn't spoil your day too badly. As the salesman started to walk away, the bewildered blind girl called out to him, Mister? He paused and turned to look back at those blind eyes. She said, Are you Jesus? Are you Jesus? He stopped in mid-stride, then slowly he made his way to catch the later flight with the question burning and bouncing about in his soul. Are you Jesus? Do people mistake you for Jesus? That is our destiny, is it not? To be so much like Jesus that people cannot tell the difference as we live and interact with a world that is blind to his love, his life, and his grace. If we claim to know him, we should live, walk, and act as he would. Knowing him is more than simply quoting scripture and going to church. It's actually living in the word as life unfolds day by day. You are the apple of his eye, even though we too have been bruised by a fall. He stopped what he was doing and picked you up and me up on a hill called Calvary, and he paid in full for the damaged fruit. I don't know where you are with the Lord. I don't know everybody's situation. I pray you are walking with him 
But maybe you, like me, at times have let that walk get way too much looking like the world around us. And we end up chasing after the wind, thinking if we just get a little bit more, we'll be what? Happy. Will we? No. If you are a dad, joy. You have a blessing from God. Not an easy one. Because you must be the corrector, but the one who does it lovingly. The one who does it with patience. The one who does it in such a way that when your sons and your daughters are grown, they still want to hang around with what? With you. There was a point after Peggy and I became believers that we tried to push on our oldest son and his wife to become believers. We were so excited. We couldn't believe that our life was so changed. And we were telling them and pushing. And there come a whole time when we hadn't seen them for quite a long time. Phone conversation came up. And I don't know if it was I or Peggy, but the question was, we've missed you. We'd sure like to see you. And we were told by our son, my wife and I don't want to hang around with you. You talk way too much about religion. And I realized in my greatest zeal that he would have what I have, I pushed him away. You see, I didn't stop to think, he's just like me. I taught him everything. I could be led to Christ, but you could not push me to him. It's like a wet noodle. Have you ever seen that on a plate? If you grab the end and pull it, the noodle will follow. But if you try to push on the end with the noodle, what does it do? Bunches up and stop. I had to say to him, I'm sorry. Not for wanting him to be a believer. I never could be sorry for that. But sorry that I didn't have the compassion and care to bring him along slowly. And I'm still doing that. Are you growing somebody? Are you living in a way, whether you have family or not, that others can see Jesus? Are you the only Bible maybe that they're reading? I want to leave you with that thought today. It's a good day though. It's a Father's Day. And we should leave here with joy. Let me pray. Father, I pray your guidance and direction on this word that has come out. I pray that I have used scripture accurately and that you would cause your spirit to take this message today and apply it first to my heart, then to every other man's heart, and to every woman and to the children. I pray that they too have gotten something. This is only possible through you. And I pray that in Christ's name.